We're with Mustafa Akul here in Berlin at the Archon's Religious Freedom Conference. He's a friend of ours. We met Mustafa many years ago in Brussels, and we've had him on several programs. He's listed in the program here as author, journalist, and political commentator. Uh, but I would also say brave man. I would add that to it. Uh, uh, You're a black man, I would say. <laughs> because you... Uh, you really speak out, and I, and I am uh, in awe of that courage, frankly. I know you have a new book out, too. We're going to talk about that soon. You're going around the United States uh, speaking about that and speaking about the issues. But let's talk about this. Why is this issue important to you? You are Sunni Muslim, are you not? I'm a Muslim, Sunni Muslim, yes. Uh, I have some reformist views within the Sunni tradition, okay. but by large, by, you know, in the most basic definition, yeah, I'm a Sunni Muslim. But I am uh, also a passionate believer in religious freedom for my tradition and other traditions and other faiths uh, in the world as well. Because first, from my conscience and also from the teachings that I understand from the Quran, freedom is the basis of any religiosity. I mean, if you force people to do a religious practice or if you force them to join a faith or if you force them to remain in the faith, you're making them hypocritical. And I've seen many examples of this in, in authoritarian societies. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, there is this institution called the religious police, which forces every woman to cover their hair, for example. And I've seen many times that, I mean, I take a flight from Riyadh to Istanbul, all women enter the plane with head covers, half of them leave with miniskirts, and which shows that, well, some of them are not doing this out of their own conscience. And when you force them to do this, you're killing the very basis of religion, which is free choice. And, and, and a conscience, uh, like a conviction, based on, based on, based on uh, your, your real, general feelings and thoughts. Uh, that's why, and, and I, I've also seen that, like, I mean, the attacks on religious freedom have created a lot of tragedy in the world. People have been killed, persecuted, humiliated, uh, simply because their fates, their, their different interpretations of the faith have been uh, persecuted. And now, in countries like Syria, we're seeing a war with pretty religious connotations, a civil war. In uh, Syria, we actually saw and learned a few days ago about the kidnapping, the so-called kidnapping. I think the details are still not there. Uh, the kidnapping of 13, 12 or 13, I'm not sure the exact number, nuns that were taken from an Orthodox convent. Uh, we know of two bishops that are, for all intents and purposes, in April disappeared, and no one's heard anything about them. Um, what does that mean to you? What, when you have religious people who are there to bring people to Christ and to heal people, why are they being kidnapped? What, what's up there? Do you, do you have any thoughts on it? In Syria right now, I mean, the regime is a brutal regime that has really uh, bombed villages and towns. But on the other hand, within the opposition, there are now very radical groups who fight the regime based on religious grounds, but also who fight everybody who disagree with them. They were already fanatic in their ideology. They are like, these are like Al-Qaeda type of groups. Their understanding of Islam is a very peculiar and a very problematic one. They think they have ultimate access to the truth. They only know what is right. And even fellow Muslims who disagree with them are heretics. Uh, and they have used violence against, uh, against fellow Muslims, and of course Christians and other traditions as well. So that is a very problematic strain within Islam, which was there in the first centuries of Islam too. Well, maybe Christianity had its own crusaders and inquisitors. Well, we, had in the we had difficulties, yeah, we yeah. had difficulties. And the good thing is that Christianity moved beyond those, I mean, in the modern age, yeah. but we still have those very fanatic groups. And although they represent, of course, mainstream Islam, they create a lot of harm against innocent people, non-Muslim or non-Muslim. So in, in Syria, we are seeing that very dangerous strain growing up within the opposition, although I would generally support the opposition if it wants free and fair elections in Syria. Uh, yeah, and, and the opposition started a revolution with justified uh, claims and goals. But things got really complicated, and it's also the nature of the conflict. Uh, I mean, the more people are in a military conflict, the more they get radicalized, and, and all the violence maybe makes them. It seems, I mean, you're a commentator, so I'm sure you've seen this, but it seems in today's world people have to take a position they cannot come into dialogue. It's my way or the highway. Uh, that's a very dangerous way to build a civilization, is it not? Certainly, it's a very dangerous. I mean, it's a, it's a recipe for a clash between civilizations. It's a recipe for clash within the civilization, too, as we are seeing right now in, in Egypt, in Iraq, even. 
Uh, and I mean, this is not what classical mainstream Islam is. I mean, this is a very troubled era in the history of the Islamic civilization. And we are seeing these very fanatic groups springing, you know, like just coming out of a, like a very dangerous crucible. Uh, as a Muslim, I'm trying to claim the values of my faith as I believe in them against them and against anybody, of course. Uh, also, of, of course, against the people who say these are the real Muslims, and yes. so there are also there, there are some are people in the, for, yeah. yeah there are some people in the West who like to say that Bin Laden is a real Muslim, like no, and why are you insisting that way? I mean, do you want all Muslims to be like him? And is that so? Th there is some Islamophobic rhetoric. I mean, by but it, of course that is fed by all the problematic yes. ex expressions of Islam that we have right now. Uh, one thing, I mean, religious freedom should not be a goal of secular, you know, worldviews, and, and it can be, of course, a secular person can defend religious freedom as well. But if religious freedom is just defended from a secular paradigm, it won't convince the believers. You should make a religious case for religious freedom. And that's what, with my book, Islam Without Extremes, A Muslim Case for Liberty, I tried to do. I said, well, it is in the Quran, in our basic texts and traditions, that there is the basic religious freedom that we have to honor and respect. The problem we face, I think, in, in society today, too, is that everything is fed to us in sound bites. It has to be quick so I can understand it. Uh, don't bore me with the facts. Just give me your opinion. Well, you have to have facts in order to learn, in order to create, in order to be a person who is informed to make sound decisions. Uh, talk to us a little bit about your book, because I know you're going throughout the United States. Uh, you're on a book tour, and I want to support that book tour, and I want to tell our listeners to go and buy your book and talk to you, uh, because you. I've found you to be a yeah. I, I found you to be a very open person, and uh, I found again. I said it from the beginning that you're brave to come here and to speak as you have spoken. So talk to us a little bit more about that book. Well, my book, Islam Without Extremes, A Muslim Case for Liberty, uh, it was published by a U.S. publisher, Norton, in 2011. We just launched a paperback copy recently. Uh, and it's a, it, it already recently came, the Turkish version came out a few months ago. An Arabic version is on its way. Indonesian version is coming. So I wrote first in English, but then it's, it's out there in the world. Uh, and, of course, it's available everywhere in the U.S. And the... The main issue I'm trying to do in the book is that I try to defend freedom as a value from a Muslim point of view. Much has been discussed in the past few decades about democracy in the Muslim world. And of course, democracy is very important. But if you don't have a strong sense of freedom, simply electoral democracy doesn't solve your problems. I mean, you can have free and fair elections. Somebody can come to power and say, well, I'm in power now, and I'm decreeing that nobody will do this, nobody will do that. So that, that political party or leader can impose its will. We have it, in this case, we would have a uh, electoral but illiberal authoritarian democracy. That's why I think civil liberties are also very important, especially in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Turkey, in countries where it's possible that elect electoral democracy bring a political party that is not liberal in its, in its, in its worldview and its practice. Uh, so I focus on specific issues like religious freedom. Like I have a chapter in my book titled Freedom from Islam. Because one of the burning issues when it comes to freedom in our part of the world, in the Middle East, is that apostasy is seen as a crime, yes. punishable by death. Yes. Uh, I mean, in other words, if you say, well, I used to be a Muslim, uh, sorry, I became convinced by Christian literature and I'm now inspired by Christianity, I became a Christian. You can get an execution for this. This happened in Afghanistan, in Saudi Arabia, in Pakistan. And I'm arguing against these laws in, in, that, in that chapter. I'm showing that, first of all, this has nothing to do with the Quran. The Quran doesn't say you should kill people if they change their religion. It comes from the medieval understanding in Islam, which considered apostates as traitors to the community. Uh, actually, early medieval writers sometimes think of apostates. Uh, when, when you look at their writings, they're speaking of people who desert from the Muslim army and join the enemy. The Hanafi scholars, for example, one of the four Sunni schools, they said, Apostates should be punished only if they're males, females on count. This was not misogyny. This was the fact that this was a recognition of the fact that only males are soldiers, and you know you, you consider apostate actually basically a soldier who deserted from your army. To now, in that medieval context, maybe it could have been understood. I mean, in that meaning, no army tolerates high, high treason today. But in the modern world today, everything has changed, and changing your religion is just your personal belief. So it should be respected. It should certainly not be regarded as a crime and punished. So that's one of the uh, arguments that I'm uh, like. Uh, 
putting forward. forward it sounds like a tremendous book. Finally, you're here. Why are you here? Why did you come to the conference besides being invited? Well, yeah, I, mean, I got a nice email six months ago saying, will you come to uh, Berlin? And I'm here because I, I know the archons are trying to defend religious freedom for everybody, but also especially for the ecumenical patriarch, patriarch Hayton in some way. And I'm a defender of the rights of the ecumenical patriarchate too, because I think the rights of the ecumenical patriarchate in Turkey are not honored yet in full. I mean, we have had some good progress, yeah. and I appreciate that. And the current government did some good steps. But it's not, it's not fully respected. And as a Muslim, I feel bad when I see that. Like, this is my country. I'm a Muslim. I'm a Turk. And I should be proud uh, when I look at the level of religious freedom in Turkey. I feel ashamed when a Christian church in Turkey is not being opened out of a, some uh, nonsense technicality and Christians don't have the right to practice. Similarly, I'm ashamed when a Turkish conservative Muslim woman cannot wear a headscarf and go to the state university, which was the case until a few years ago. So, uh, I mean, I, I'm here because I defend religious freedom wherever in the world it is. I mean, the issue from China to Arakan, and sometimes Muslims are persecuted, like the case in, in, in some of these authoritarian states. But especially if religious freedom is violated by Muslims, I'm more enraged as a fellow Muslim. I'm just like, we don't deserve to doing, be doing this to ourselves and to, to, to other people that we are uh, really oppressing in this case. Therefore, I want a more free Turkey, a free Turkey for everybody, conservative Muslims, non-conservative Muslims, Christians, Jews, uh, atheists. Yeah. And uh, I hope the, this conference can be a contribution to first understanding the problem and then also calling for, for some change. Great. Thanks very much for being here. I appreciate My it. Pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.